Hi, everyone. I think we're ready to start. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight for this special event featuring four RISD alumni whose creative spirit and entrepreneurship mirror those of RISD's founder, Helen Adelia Rowe Metcalf. This will be my last event for RISD as um, executive director of alum uh, executive director of alumni and family relations. I'm going to be retiring, and um, and I couldn't be more honored uh, than to conclude my tenure by convening these amazing women for a conversation with each other and with you about their inspiration, challenges, and the passions that sustain them. Before we jump in, I want to. Go over a little bit of housekeeping. You have all been muted for the presentation and we encourage you to post questions in the Q&A feature. We'll do our best uh, to answer them in the second half of the program. Our panel tonight is moderated by Renee Watkins Payne, a 1983 graduate of RISD and graphic design. I've had the great pleasure of working with Renee on the RISD multicultural group the Martin Luther King celebrations, RIS diversity, and more. She is the founder and director of Favor Design and Communications, a multidisciplinary studio specializing in brand identity, art direction, and design. Renee has worked in the field of design for over 25 years, holding creative and executive positions spanning the marketplace from community organizations to Fortune 500 companies, presenting messaging that is fresh, compelling, and highly effective. Recently, Renee launched Included, a dedicated initiative of favor promoting social equity, human dignity, and environmental justice. Renee is the recipient of numerous design awards and recently completed a four-year diversity fellowship at RISD where her work focused on social equity and inclusion design initiatives, as well as teaching art for social change in partnership with the social justice organization Sankofa. Renee recently shared with me that she's been working with the Daughters of the Movement, a group of women who sat at the feet of those who were on the front lines of the civil rights movement. Really exciting stuff, but I'm gonna let her tell you more about that and the other important work that she is doing. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Renee Payne Watkins. Renee Watkins Payne, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you need to unmute Renee. Thank you so much, Chris. It is an honor for me to moderate tonight's alumni founders panel. My life has brought me back full circle to RISD. Years ago, my high school art teacher and a RISD alumni, John McPhee, drove myself and three of my high school classmates to Saturday morning figure drawing classes at what he claimed was named the best art school in the country, the Rhode Island School of Design. It was my first exposure to RISD that would connect me to lifelong valued relationships, experiences, and lead me to explore illustration and graphic design. Never would I have thought I would someday complete a social equity fellowship last June here at RISD and help set a foundation towards social and equitable change at the institution for a number of design initiatives. It was towards the end of my fellowship last year, I had a moral responsibility to dedicate an arm of my company favor to social equity and inclusion initiatives for the world. Right before the pandemic included was birthed. And it's, it has been a season to pay it forward creatively, culturally and intentionally through my design business and as an educator and mentor to a range of students and young artists in these very, very critical times. It has been a focused time uh, supporting the National Black COVID Alliance in creating communications platforms that bridge data and emotion and really honor black lives that have been lost to COVID-19. And myself and my team have been working with Harvard University's Office for Diversity and Community Partnership around unconscious bias, a very, very important issue and concern for the world right now. And we're committed to helping Harvard connect internally around unconscious bias and bring forth the voices of the Harvard community and also represent artistic stories that, that, that represent who Harvard is right now. And we're honoring the civil rights leaders as Chris had mentioned uh, with the Daughters of the Movement. 
And they are the daughters of the movement. It's Gina Belafonte, who was the daughter of Julie and Harry Belafonte, Alasha Shabazz, who's the daughter of Malcolm X, and uh, Betty Shabazz. And just to name one more, uh, Hasna Muhammad, who's the daughter of Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee. So it has been a complete honor really using myself, my gifts, my heart for this world right now through my design firm, Favor, and Included. And it is an honor tonight, again, to be before you and, and really honor Women's History this month with an exciting panel of alumni designers and founders carrying the entrepreneurial spirit of Helen Adelia Roe Metcalf. Our first panelist is Sarah Durham. And Sarah is a, is a 1992 graduate of the illustration department at, at RISD and is an entrepreneur and creative consultant with a passion for helping nonprofits communicate more effectively so they can advance their missions. She founded Big Duck in 1994 to help nonprofits increase their visibility, raise money, and communicate more effectively. In 2019, she acquired Advamet Tech, which builds and supports websites for nonprofits. She spends her days guiding these businesses and talking with nonprofit leaders about their communications. She was named the top fundraiser under 40 by Fundraising Success Magazine in 2006 and one of the most influential women in technology by Fast Company Magazine in 2010. As an adjunct professor of NYU's Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, Sarah taught strategic communications to other aspiring nonprofit communicators for many years. Sarah, I'm gonna turn it over to you at this point. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Renee. It is <clears throat> really uh, awesome to be here today. I also just wanna give a shout out to Claire from RISD who is working behind the scenes. She's chatting out things as we go today and also thank Christina for putting this incredible group of people together. It's been really fun to get to know my fellow panelists and Renee, really inspiring to hear your story and your journey too. So thank you for sharing that with, with all of us. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, you know, I'm curious and, I, and maybe the questions we'll get from those of you who are logging in live will, will help us get to the bottom of this, but I'm curious why you are all here today, what you're interested in. If you're interested in our stories of being founders or business leaders, et cetera, um, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, as Renee mentioned, I graduated from RISD in 1992 with a degree of illustration and, um, and that was a recession. And I started, I came back to my hometown, which is New York City, and started trying to get some freelance illustration work and started doing some freelance graphic design work. And, um, and I was lucky because I had two parents who were in advertising in New York and I had good connections. And um, I, I kind of networked my way into a lot of different opportunities. And, and when I was in my early twenties, I found myself in a situation with a, a freelance client who um, essentially had enough work for me that I, I took an opportunity to set up my own company. And so I st founded Big Duck kind of by accident in my early 20s, which I actually highly recommend because you're kind of young enough, brave enough and have like no, you know, no mortgage, no big responsibilities. I just thought, oh, I'll give it a shot, see where this goes. And I wouldn't have thought that 27 years later, I would still be working in this business and, and leading a company that has grown to have, you know, I think right now we have 17 or 18 people on staff and and uh, working with organizations um, like American Friends Service Committee, which is the social justice arm of the Quaker movement. We've, we've rebranded the Center for Constitutional Rights, the Shriver Center on Poverty Law, a lot of health organizations worked deeply in education. And that's been such a, a privilege and an honor because it has um, allowed me to, um, with my staff, to learn about all kinds of people who are like, like a lot of my colleagues on this panel working to make the world a better place. And, um, and as an agency that works with nonprofits, I often feel like what we get to do is we get to be sort of like the pit crew that helps an organization kind of change the tires, get a tune up, get stronger, get better, 
maybe be faster and then get back out on the road so that they can do they can do the important work of advancing their mission. Um, in about 2000, I made the decision to specialize in working with nonprofits and we've developed a lot of very specific um, skills and things we do uh, to help nonprofits and developed a team that's very specialized and that's been a great journey. And, um, and then uh, more recently, two years ago, Renee mentioned, I, I acquired a second business called Advomatic. Advomatic is a company that builds websites for nonprofits and supports nonprofit websites with a lot of higher ed clients and um, social justice clients. And um, so for me, as, as a founder of a business and an entrepreneur, um, you know, I've thought a lot, and as we prepared for this panel, I've thought a lot about what it means to start a business and to lead a business. And um, I identify as a cisgender, white woman, Jewish, native New Yorker, and, you know, I bring all those identities to my business and I have found that over the years, um, uh, definitely, I've definitely faced some, um, some challenges and I would say some uh, unconscious bias and maybe explicit bias as a woman and as a business leader. Um, and we can talk about that more later on in this panel if it feels appropriate. Um, but I've also faced or, or been privileged with huge, Huge privilege being in New York, being in a in a um, in a city that uh, you know there's just so much opportunity and and starting a business to help nonprofits at a time when there weren't a lot of businesses helping nonprofits and being able to um, really dig into something that I'm passionate about, which is how communications and the nonprofit sector work together, um, and be you know, be, be there during the rise of social media, during the rise of thinking about branding as a strategic tool that might also benefit nonprofits. That's been a great, a great, great privilege. A um, couple of other things about me. Um, I married somebody that I met at RISD uh, who graduated uh, in 92 also. His name is Craig Weiner. He's in uh, industrial design. Um, we have 17 year old twins who are you know, banging around in the other room, uh, making dinner. And, um, and so I feel, I mean, Renee, you talked about how you sort of come full circle with RISD and uh, I haven't come full circle quite the way you have, but I definitely feel um, that the most, many of the most important people in my life are people that I met at RISD and I feel really um, honored to still be a part of the community and, and to be here with you tonight. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm going to introduce our next panelist, and that's Annie Evelyn. And Annie graduated from, from the furniture department at RISD in 1999 and returned for a Master of Fine Arts in Furniture Design in 2007. She is a studio furniture maker living in Baskerville, North Carolina. Evelyn has been working to create communities throughout her artistic practice, mentoring teens, teaching art and upholstery in community and youth centers, as well as putting on arts-based events across the country. In 2019, she co-founded Crafting the Furniture with a dedicated group of artists from Penland School of Craft to address the glaring lack of racial and ethnic diversity in the fields of art, craft, and design. Annie, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, everyone for inviting me to be on this panel and getting to speak with you. And thank you, Renee. Um, I am, uh, like Renee said, I'm a furniture maker living in uh, Bakersfield, North Carolina, which is outside of Penland School of Craft. Um, and I'm here, I think, on this panel today because of uh, the organization Crafting the Future that I co founded with some. Uh, like-minded artists from, from Penland. Um, and I thought I would just kind of tell you a little bit about our origin story and how we, we started this organization. Um, in 2015, I was a resident artist at the Penland School of Craft. And um, shortly after um, the Charleston Church Massacre, I was sitting in my studio completely unable to focus on conceptual furniture maker at a time like that. And um, I was listening to that show on point on the, you know, the NPR show and a woman came on the radio and she said, you know, look around and if you don't see any black people, there's a problem 
and you need to work on fixing it. And, you know, I, it was kind of the first time where I was like, oh, I can't just be angry at the institutions or, you know, politicians like, oh, this is also my job. And that was, that was like the first time that that, you know, where I just was like, because you feel so helpless, everybody feels helpless, you know, and I, and I did continue to feel helpless and still do, obviously, um, because there's so much to change, but, um, so I I heard, I had that in my mind, and um, I met a friend, Corey Pemberton, who is a a co-founder of, and director of Crafting the Future, and he's um, Penland in most of our communities, but very white community. He's a black gay man, you know, living in that area, being an artist. And we started talking about the lack of racial and ethnic diversity in our field. And um, it was on a trip to uh, Mardi Gras in New Orleans that we said, hey, let's stop complaining and let's let's start something. It, it kind of took us a while to figure out what that would be um, and we figured out what it would be when I was actually running a residency program in New Orleans and met um, Tamika Genius and Meg Miles from Yaya, which is Young Aspirations, Young Artists, an amazing youth arts organization in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. And we decided that we would send two students from Yaya to Penland School of Craft. So Corey and I and a group of about 15 other uh, people from Penland, a diverse group of artists who you know, were tired of, of the same old story, um, started a Kickstarter campaign and we raised $8,000 and sent two students. Um, and that was in 2019. And then in 2020, uh, COVID kind of foiled our, our plans for the year, but we did support the art. We were gonna expand and go to four students. We were very excited. We, we were like, we're gonna go slow. We're, we don't know what we're doing. We're gonna, we're gonna work it out slowly. Um, but then we ended up supporting the students in, in town. And then um, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, the world, um, you know, the, the nation kind of opened their eyes a little bit wider or, or at all. And um, we went from 50 members and $2,000 in our membership to 1,500 members and $200,000. And this year we are sending 34 students from, we've expanded our partners. Um, so many, we have so many more partners now, including RISD, we are sending two students to pre-college from Yaya um, to pre-college which was an important part of my life, so I'm excited. Um, and um, yeah, we're excited for the future. And um, beyond just sending the students to, to craft schools, we also um, are working to support the artists who are already in the field, doing the work, doing the thing. And so we're um, working on getting together grants and um, other things like that. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Annie. I'm going to introduce our last panelist, uh, Kita Turner. And in 1991, Kita graduated at, from the apparel design department at RISD. She is an award winning and nationally published interior designer who creates enduring, fashionably classic designs. Her full service interior and product design studio, Kita Turner Design, offers expertise in residential and commercial interior design and has produced environments for numerous high profile clients across the country and beyond. Kita and her design work have been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal's Off Duty, Architectural Digest, El Decor, Essence, and many more. Kita has won numerous awards and honors and served on the House Beautiful Magazine Advisory Council for 2020 and 2021. She was a member of the Point Market Style Spotters Alumni 2020 team and is a founding member of the Black Artist and Designers Guild. Kita has added home decor product design to her repertoire with her fashionable vintage and contemporary pillow collection, Livian and Neva. In 2020, House Beautiful Magazine named Living and Neva Pillow Collection, an online store to the annual roster of the best home stores in America to shop now. Kita, you have the floor. Unmuted. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me uh, amongst this esteemed panel. 
And I just want to thank Christina, uh, you know, just thank you for just being um, a supporter throughout the years. You know, I feel like we've had a, an opportunity to work together, whether I was being a judge, uh, you know, for, or what, what do we call it? I forgot what you call it. Like a, the RISD portfolio reviews to um, various uh, projects and events throughout the year. Um, so I guess, you know, I will start, I guess a bit with my, I'll try to keep this short, a bit, a bit with my origin story. So um, I am from the Midwest. I grew up, was born in Houston, grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, how I found out about RISD was through one of my high school art teachers. Um, you know, cause at one point I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor. And then I got to honors chemistry and it kind of kicked my butt. So my mother, my mother who also is a, a fine artist who went to Kansas City Art Institute and fought on college. So she's a, a painter. She, she was the one that reached out to me. It was like, Kita, you know, you've always enjoyed art and design. Why don't you think about changing your focus? So I, during, I think it was my junior year and senior year, I would drive and I'm not a morning person, but I would drive, uh, to another high school in my district for zero period. I think it was like, it started at 6 a.m., by <laughs> 30 or 6 a.m. I did that for two years in order to um, uh, build and, and make my, my portfolio stronger. And that was uh, my teacher, Lauren Davis, was the one that you know told me and my parents that if she gets into RISD, that's where she should go. And um, of course, my dad was like, who's the mathematician, was like, oh gosh, if I send her to art school, you know, it's like she's got to go, you know, somewhere good. So um, I did, I majored in apparel design. The reason for that was, well, you know, I loved fashion. It was always, it was my first love and still is my first love. Um, but I thought, I also thought practically there will always be work in the fashion industry. Um, but then once I got into the fashion industry, I was there for about nine, 10 years. I worked for uh, various companies such as Liz Claiborne, um, some smaller companies as I transitioned from women's wear to men's wear. Um, then I was there when Old Navy was launched. Um, and then the last company that I worked for full time was uh, Federated Department Stores. I was a men's wear designer for Aeropostal, which has um, their vertical uh, operation. They have stores throughout the, the country. Uh, but it was there that I became very bored and uh, tired of the very cyclical nature of fashion. Um, it was just the same thing over and over again. So I used to look out my window. Uh, we looked, uh, my window looked across at Madison Square Garden and I would just watch the people walking by and I was like, there has to be something else, you know? Uh, but I just, I, I wanna just mention before I li landed at Federated Department Store, I did have a few stints freelancing in between, in between my full-time gigs. And I think it was that freelancing that um, uh, you know, planted the seed inside of me where I realized that one, I, was make, I made more money freelancing <laughs> than I did working for a company. And it just, it, you know, because there's a lot of fear. There's fear that, that's just natural embedded, embedded in going out on your own. So I think it was that. It was that seed that finally gave me the guts to, to pursue interiors. And, you know, my mom was doing it uh, a bit on the side. I worked for her, with her for a couple of years. And then finally, I just was kind of, I, I almost pushed myself into it because uh, I just wasn't happy where I was. So uh, one of my first clients was a young lady that attended a, a party I had at my home at a house party she walked in and she was like whoa you know you're living like this <laughs> you know one day I'm going to hire you uh I didn't believe her I was still in fashion too but she did she opened up a wine boutique and that was my first commercial project didn't know what I was doing but I figured it out and from there most of my work has come from word of mouth uh over the last 20 plus years um I will say though that my journey hasn't necessarily been easy. You know, I'm sure probably one of the, the best ways to enter a field is probably to intern at some, you know, at, at larger or some of the best known firms. But I didn't do that because at this point I really wanted to, I was, I was done working for, I call the man, 
I was done working for other people. <laughs> so, um, but it's just been the school of hard knocks. Um, and like I said, it hasn't been easy and just getting the, I don't want to call it notoriety, but getting the exposure that you need to build a business has not been easy. Um, uh, then, it, then I think it was 2018. Um, I think, I don't know if you mentioned, or that was in my other, my other bio. I'm also one of the uh, founding members of, oh no, it is here. I'm a founding member of the Black Artists and Designers Guild. So while I am not the founder of the Black Artists and Designers Guild, I uh, was probably one of the um, catalysts to getting that organization started. Um, you know, back in 2018, looked around, there were events and panels happening throughout our industry. And these panels were very, you know, the void of black people, people that look like me. Um, so I mentioned it to my girlfriend, Melanie Barnett, and she was like, you should say something. I was like, no, I can't. I'll be blacklisted. I can't say something, you know, I just, I can't. So again, riddled with that, that fear of speaking out and speaking um, my truth and our truth. Um, so she did. <laughs> she wasn't, she was in the business, but not really an interior designer. She was a product designer. She did. It rattled the industry uh, from, from 2000 on, 18 on out. Things have changed. Uh, I, you can even look on my press page. You can visually see where I'm starting 2018 on, where I'm starting to get more press from Architectural Digest, El Decor, House Beautiful, bigger names that were before we're just basically virtually ignoring us. If we were not one of two black designers that they decided that they would throw their hat behind or give all of the press and prestige to. So that has changed. Um, but it's, you know, you know, I do feel that in many cases, I probably could have been further along if we just were not, or if I was just not virtually ignored, which tends to happen a lot to people of color in, in a very white dominated um, industries. And I will, it's just not one industry, it's all industries. Um, and then from there also, I started my line, Livia Neva, which is something I have been wanting to start forever. And again, fear kept me from just, you know, going full throttle and doing it. But Livia Neva is, um, inspired by my great grandmothers. Uh, one of my great grandmothers, Olivia, or Ali, we call her, um, was from Papua New Guinea. So she came to America in 1890, um, to, landed in Kansas City. And the, I won't go into that story. And then my other great grandmother um, um, on, my, on my mother's side, her name was Geneva. And she was uh, part, uh, she was African, African American and part Native American, so I'm I'm just inspired by them and then my grandmother's uh, Catherine, who was a home economics teacher in the South, um, and so my a lot of my, my my pillows are made from vintage fabrics as well as new fabrics, and I put them together. I fashion them as if they were a fashion line. So it's given me the opportunity to reach back into my fashion background and to. Uh, bring something to the market that's quicker than uh, designing a uh, environment or a space. So that's my story. I know it may have been a little bit all around, <laughs> all over the place, but I hope that gives people a, a gist of where I am and at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Kita. Now we're going to get into some questions. <laughs> and just coming off of um, your talk, uh, Kita, I love the inspiration from your family and your connections to heritage, what advice would you give, particularly to some of the RISD students that might be watching uh, in understanding how to prepare them for entrepreneurship? Wow, I don't know how necessarily to prepare. I think that it, there is a certain personality. I think all the other you know, um, panelists would agree, uh, maybe part crazy, but I think you have to be you have, you cannot be afraid of risk. I mean, honestly, this is the longest job I've ever had. It's 20 plus years. 
um, longer, the, the, the longest jobs I've had prior to that were probably four years, six years. Um, you know, but it, at this point, I just, it's hard to see myself actually going back and working for someone full time. But, you know, I would say, you know, definitely get, you know, work for someone. If you can work in corporate America or work with, for another entrepreneur, that's probably the smartest thing to do, but also to follow your passion. And I'm learning, I've had to learn the hard way is to be true to your voice, be true to your community and, and, and try it. You know, I had a conversation with a woman today who's trying to branch out from a, a very cushy job. And she was concerned about, should she add this or add that? And I said, why don't you just try it, test the market. And if it doesn't work, then you can pull it away. You can, you can remove it. Sarah, Annie, do you have any, any thoughts, any comments? Yeah, I, I, I really love what Keita talked about. I think that there's so much truth in all of that, the try, trying it, you know, your point about trying it. I think that it takes, it, it, maybe a kind of confidence and and in my case a lot of ignorance um to try things sometimes that sometimes and i think this is also another benefit of of starting a business when you perhaps don't know what you're doing i mean i definitely agree with Keita's point that it's great if you can work at another company or intern because i think that really does educate you about what you're getting into and i i didn't do that and i think not doing that probably meant i had to learn things on my own a lot slower and a lot harder um, although I think in some ways, sometimes, you know, what you don't, if you don't know how hard it's going to be, <laughs> sometimes you have, it gives you a kind of tenacity to power through challenges right. that you might not have otherwise. Um, but I, I think that being an entrepreneur or a business owner, you know, I mean, it, it, I think he is totally right. It's hard work and it does not come easy and it does come with you know, there, there's the sort of sexy part people imagine, like the autonomy that you have or the power that you have or the flexibility that you have, that's true. But but there's also, um, it takes a lot of tenacity because there are definitely hard times, dark times. If, if things hit the skids financially, you're the one who doesn't get paid. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have staff, you're paying your staff, but you're not paying yourself. You're, you're the one who's, you know, getting the debt or, stress or whatever. Um, so I think it takes a lot of confidence, a lot of vision, a lot of inspiration, tenacity and hard work. Um, and I think, I think you have to believe in your own voice. You know, you have to believe in the, that you have something to say. Thank you. Annie, do you have any uh, thoughts? Yeah, I'll just, just kind of, you know, echo, echo what they're saying. I think I call it, you know, signing my name on the dotted line. It's like I, I sign up for it if I'm ready or not. And once once I've got my name out there and I said, I'm going to do it, I have to do it. I mean, and that's, you know, I walked into Yaya and was like, I'm going to raise money for a scholarship, you know, had, hadn't collected everybody up yet, hadn't had, didn't have a plan, didn't know what was going to happen. Just said, we can do this. I know we can, I don't know how, but I know we can do this. And I feel like, you know, I do that a lot with my furniture career as well. It's just like, you know, I say, I'm going to organize a show at this space for five months from now. And I'm going to, that's going to make me, I'm going to rent a booth at ICFS, you know, at International Contemporary Furniture Fair. I'm going to do this or that. And it's like, once you sign up, you, you got to make it happen because there's accountability. So that's what I like to do. Yeah. Well, you are all doing amazing work. And I'd like to know as three females, um, how does that affect your work and your path right now? Does someone, should I, should I go as a, as a female? Yeah. Um, it does affect, I mean, I, you know, just to get the personal, I, I do feel like when I first, um, started you know I had it all planned out mapped out gonna have this business that would you know free me up to be able to have a family and children and you know and I could work from home or you know if you know if I grew beyond that 
And it didn't quite <laughs> work out that way, but it, I also, I maybe underestimated the amount of work and attention that being an entrepreneur and especially a solopreneur requires. So some things were, were sacrificed. I mean, I, you know, didn't, you know, while I may have this business and these businesses and I'm very passionate about them. Um, some, you know, I don't know if you can always have everything, but some things give. Like I, 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 there are many times when I am up late, no matter how much I try to um, make sure that I put myself first and make sure that self-care is um, a integral and vital part of my regimen it's still like if you have a deadline you have to get that deadline done and just being able to let go also and be able to delegate hire the right people especially if you're a certain personality um being able to trust that other people can step in and and do the job and then another thing that i and i'll just maybe other people can speak to this as a female i have found this to be an issue also asking for and getting the, the fees that I feel that I am worth. Cause I, and I find that sometimes men, I don't care what industry they're in, they tend to ask for what they want. They don't apologize for what they want and they don't second guess what they want. And that has also, that has been an issue of mine. And it's just even, this year, I am finally putting my foot down because I was like, I need to grow. I've, I've had to turn away some jobs that were, that are just not, they're not going to help me reach that mark. And it's hard because I want, I'm a, I am I feel like I need to please, or yes, I've worked with you before. So I, you know, we should, you know, like I should do this again, you know. Yeah, I think I think those are all great points. Uh, I would say, as a female founding a business and running a business, I, what I have experienced uh, that I think adds to what Keita just talked about are, are two things. The first is that, um, particularly when I was younger, like in my twenties and maybe my early thirties, I and I didn't I didn't actually observe this consciously until later, but I regularly had the experience of people assuming my business was something maybe smaller or lesser than it had been. I, I, I actually had a, I had a really uh, an experience that really brought this into contrast for me very clearly a few years ago when I had two people that I knew who were friends um, and I'd known for a long time and they came to meet me at my office uh, after work one day and they walked into my office and I and and the the big duck office at the time was a very big, Space with a beautiful view of the Brooklyn Bridge and like conference rooms and offices and it was like a, a legit office and they walked in and they were like oh this is a real office I never I, I didn't really think it was like a real office and I was like where, where did where did you think I was doing <laughs> you know what do you think was going on here and I realized that I had actually had that experience a lot where people and, and I, I chalk this up to uh, a kind of sexism that people sort of don't necessarily imagine that a business started by a female is a legit business the same way they might assume a business started by a male might be. Um, so I, I've experienced that a lot. And, I, and as I've gotten older and I've gotten to know more people who own businesses like mine, I found that when I speak to uh, people who identify as male, they so often um, got to places faster than I did, but not because they were smarter or more talented or more capable, more so just because doors opened for them faster. People were more, they, as Kita said, they were more, more likely to ask for what they wanted or demand what they wanted. And also they had networks uh, you know, professional networks dominated by other men and, and, you know, oftentimes a very white male dominated sort of boys club. Um, and so I, I, um, definitely have experienced that quite a bit. Uh, I think the, the slowing, just taking longer to get there. Um, right. thank you. Annie, you have any thoughts? 
around that? Sure, sure. Um, I think, you know, I noticed, I think the bias or whatever left in crafting the future and, and maybe that's, it, you know, most nonprofits suffer by women. So it's like, I'm mostly working with women in that field. Um, and our director of crafting the future is a, is a man. And so maybe, I don't know, uh, we haven't, we haven't dealt with that very much there, but, you know, as a female woodworker, I know all about all that, <laughs> um, very much so. I mean, people will come into my studio and stand in front of my table saw and ask who makes the furniture. And I'm just like, you know, make my head spin. And um, so, yeah, the, there's the, you know, and I, I just, I always say it's like, we believe men, you know? And, and I think women do too. It's not just men, you know, it's like we, we all believe men when they say they, they do this, they do that, they can do this if they've never done it, you know? And then, you know, women, we, we don't, uh, female identified people don't recognize as much, like I, I can extrapolate, well, if I can do this, I can do that. And, you know, I've done all this stuff and of course I can do whatever I want. And so, yeah, I, you know, I teach sometimes and I definitely try to drive that, that point home to, to, uh, to all the people who, who question whether or not they can do whatever they want. Thank you. You know, we, we talk about the business side, but then there's the self-care side. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about self-care. How do you all take care of yourselves? And what advice would you give to other young entrepreneurs or those that have been out in the business for a while? Let's talk about self-care, particularly in a pandemic year. Get sleep. <laughs> which I'm not very good at but um you know you have to know your clock um I know I naturally need eight hours um but a lot of times I live off of five just because um again the nature of my business and the fact that I you know obviously probably need to scale and get more help but um I, the long, the older I get, I realize that sleep is like, like, you know, like the other day I was in the bed. So I was like, this is just heaven. Oh, this is, this feels like heaven. So like, you know, when I was younger, going to a party, whatever, that was fun. But now sleep is, is important. Um, you know, exercising also just, I think for me, um, really, making sure I have a, a more productive day or, 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 or putting processes in place that I feel that work and allow me to uh, run my day and my businesses better. So whether it's, you know, Mondays and Fridays are for call, discovery phone calls and meetings and Tuesdays are for meetings, then every other day allows me to, you know, block out days like so if Thursdays are for invoices and proposals I find that that allows me to run a more um I don't know to, whether it's having control or just feeling like I know I have a I have processes so I know it's it allows me to organize up here and then organize um externally and uh, to me that's all that's part of uh self-care and letting go of what I don't need and saying no learning to say no. Important one. We actually have a few questions from the audience and I wanna make sure we can get those in. So I'm gonna to shift to those questions right now. And the first one is, uh, you each talked about either family members or teams to provide guidance and support. How would you advise students that might not have that resource? For example, first generation to college students. Sarah, you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that it, it is a great gift to be to be blessed with people who support you. But the most important asset you have, if you're going to really do anything, is your belief in yourself and your own vision. And um, and and as you, I mean, for me, I think some of the, the most critical things I've learned about business, I've actually learned just from reading books 
and talking to other people and asking people, reaching out to people to ask questions and to try to develop a, a mentoring environment for myself over the years. And I, I mean, I think, I think sometimes the notion of a mentor, I don't know, I've, I've never found that the traditional notion of a mentor has worked for me. I can't say that there is like one person who over 20 years or 30 years has been a mentor. But what I have found really, really valuable is when I see somebody doing something that kind of amazes me and I think I can learn from, I have over the years tried to write to those people or be in touch with them and, and just say like, could I just pick your brain in a quick conversation about that and just learn a bit from you? And I find that sometimes people become almost like micro mentors. Like you don't go to them all the time for everything. They're not committing to talking to you forever, but they're happy to have a couple of conversations and help you figure something out. And really appreciative of the opportunity to connect with somebody new or unexpected. Um, so I would say, you know, read, reach out to people you admire, talk to them and build a network. And I think RISD, if you're a RISD student is a great resource for that because you have the alumni network, you have, you know, people like us, you have, you know, the, the, uh, the faculty and, and over the years, I think you'll find your colleagues who are students are gonna be a great resource too. Great, thank you, Sarah. Next question. What advice would you give to yourself um, through time, first as a RISD freshman and then as a 25 year old? Um, I, I don't know if Annie wanna take that. I, um, okay, so just repeat that question again. I don't know if I can remember to what when I was 25. Give to yourself. <laughs> through time, first as a RISD freshman, then as a 25 year old, maybe a little older, but going from freshman to somebody that's been, been in the field for a little while. Well, for as a freshman, I would say, I know when I was, when I was a freshman, I was just, you know, my dad told me, you have four years to get out on my money. <laughs> and then any, so I just took that seriously. Um, I don't know, like I just was having a lot of all-nighters and I just remember everybody was sleeping. So I don't, part of it was I felt as a black woman um, and just growing up with parents who grew up in, um, during Jim Crow South, my parents always told me you have to work harder, you have to be smarter, you gotta just work 300 times harder. So I just really, I think I took that literally um, cause I didn't want to fail out. So maybe I was, I didn't, was lacking some self-esteem, you know, just thinking that I had to just, you know, I, I don't know if I was necessarily having imposter syndrome, but I just was like worried about are there people going to be much, you know, better than me. And, you know, and the truth is yes, in life, <laughs> You will be more you will be more talented than some people, and there will be people who are more talented than you. But you can't worry about looking around. And I'm still learning that lesson, even as a 50 year old woman, that you can look around. You, if you look around, that's the kiss. That's the worst thing you can do. At some point, you have to just believe in who you are and believe in what you have to bring to your, whether it be your trade, whether it be your community, the global community or, or whoever, there's, you, we all have a, some nuggets that we can disperse and that people can take away and learn from. But we, again, we just like, like Sarah said, we have to believe in ourselves. And on that point, okay. sorry. Oh, I was just gonna add a little bit, if it, if it, but we can move on. I don't no, know. Annie. I Okay, I was just going to say, you know, freshmen, 25, 35, 45, 55, but I think like the biggest thing that I've learned is that, you know, when we were kids in our bedroom doing our art projects, you know, success wasn't defined. It was, we were expressing ourselves and that's like what to hold on to. Like every, you know, we get you get competitive when you get in school, you get competitive when you're in a job and it's just like, 
why are we doing this? It doesn't have anything to do with like an external, um, you know, assessment of success. So, you know, your, your next piece is what you should be striving for, your next thing, your next personal success. And then, you know, I think when you're, you know, focused more myopically on to being, being the best you and doing the next project better than you are, you, you, you know, people do notice that. And it's just, and you, then you don't get so emotionally caught up in the like, I mean, it is when you start, it's emotional, like feeling like, oh, that person got, you know, this award and I didn't, and, you know, I must be bad. And it's just, you know, it's just not, not true. It's not why you're making work and it doesn't matter. And there's so many talented artists who have lived and died in, in um, obscurity and it's okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Oh, as time is going by so fast. If you could give one piece of advice as a takeaway to our audience tonight, what would that be connected to entrepreneurship and direction from each of you? I guess I'll just go ahead and go. Um... If you, if there's something that you want to change, something you want to do, sign your name on the dotted line, do it. Don't worry. You know, you might, you might mess up here and there. Don't sweat it. Just keep, keep moving in that direction. Yeah. And sometimes you don't take yourself so seriously. Try to learn to have fun along the way and determine what it is, you know, like where I am right now, I'm also thinking about what, you know, what do I want my, the next half of my life to look like? <laughs> I love it. If I knew Annie's how to put thinking, my mustache Annie, on. <laughs> Annie's thinking, you know, what does she want to look, what does she want to look like for the next five minutes? Yeah, I, 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 I might not need to do that. I just pull out my my tweezers, though. <laughs> and you know, and I I would add. I mean, I I love what Annie was just talking about about you know. Remember when you were that kid making art projects in your room? And I think that that kind of um, internal dialogue that you have with yourself when you fall in fell in love with making things. I think that's the same dialogue and the same inspiration and creativity you bring to starting a business or running a business or really, or anything you do. And, and I, I guess I would just add, like, listen to that voice. You know, if that voice is telling you that it's time to change or it's time to do something new or time to lead or time to step back, I think there's a, there's a lot to listen to in that. I, you know, a friend of mine said to me at one point that, um, you know, life isn't a static thing. It has chapters and ups and downs and you evolve, you, you evolve with it. And I think um, you have to be very adaptive when you do something entrepreneurial. So listening, to, you know, listening to that voice and trusting that voice, you know, and RISD is such a great place to develop that because I think that's so much what the crit is about is like learning to listen to yourself. Why did I make this? How do I talk about it? What, you know, how do I defend it? Or, you know, and that's really the same skill. Thank you so much. You have been a wonderful panel. Just wanna thank you again, Sarah, Annie, Kita. Thank you so much. And a special thank, thank you to the Office of Inst Institutional Engagement, uh, Chris Hartley, Mariam Han, Claire Robinson, the Alumni Association, thank you for giving us this platform. And we hope that you all just received from this time. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Renee. And thank You're you, an Renee. Awesome facilitator. Yes. Awesome. Did an thank you, Renee. Job. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Christina. Good Thanks, night. Claire. Bye.